special? Why are we celebrating them today? Well, this is something that only happens once every 17 years. And last was 1996, of course. And uh, you just don't get anything like this really any results in the country, except for the eastern United States, where you have this mass emergence of insects all coming out at roughly the same time, you know, going through a flurry of mating activity, and then all dying within two weeks, and it's all over every 17 years. So it's really it's unique to this part of the country. So um, we have big collections, we like to celebrations. And so, John, what dictates that 17-year cycle? Why is it so specific? Well, that's a good question, and I wish we had the answer to that. <laughs> there are a lot of hypotheses, a lot of theories out there, and all of them have something wrong with them. Uh, they usually invoke things like glaciation and predators and all that, but, you know, all the other 5,000 cicada species in the world have experienced predators, and many of them also glaciers. So that's just not enough of an explanation. We're working on it. So, I could hear the cicada in your hand just then. I want to know a little bit about their mating calls. How are male and female cicadas different? Yeah. So I have here a periodical cicada in my hand. It's, it's harmless. And you can tell it's making a noise uh, because I picked it up and disturbed it. If you look at a periodical cicada and you raise up the wings, or any cicada, you'll see some organs right here that are called timbles. And these are the sound producing organs. And the abdomen is hollow, hollow when it resonates and it amplifies the sound. This cicada, uh, makes a mating call that sounds like this. And females respond to that call by licking their wings. And I had him doing it a little bit right before he came up, uh, and we'll try to work on him a little bit. He seems to be more interested in actually having a snack than mating <laughs> right now. But this is a periodical cicada, and this is what's making all the noise in the trees in various parts uh, of our area. So, Ed, how is the cicada going to act differently once it finds its mate? So it's going to be sending out these calls, right? The male's sending out these calls trying to search for its mate. How does that behavior change once, once it finds a mate? Well, once the female responds, if you look at her wings, the male will give it a, a different kind of call. And then to go back and forth, and finally the mating will occur. Do you have an example of that call? Well, well you know what? I think this guy's going to be trying to feed. But I will walk you through it. These insects, these insects have the most complex courtship that we know of, of cicadas, and perhaps for all, all insects. This male will fly and call in the trees, and he'll make calls that sound like this. And he'll make about three of those and fly to a new place and make three more. When a female responds by flicking her wings, then he'll shift. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll go to something we call a part two sound. She'll respond one more time at the end, and he'll begin a part three call. And as he's doing that, he's approaching the female, he'll vibrate her with his foreleg, and he'll climb on and out. And how long does the mating actually take place? So once they actually begin copulating, the mating usually takes at a minimum, say about an hour. The maximum that we measured is 96 hours. And after that mating session, how long do they live? Once they mate,
This may seem, I, I, I don't know if this is a question you answered already, but is the 17 year cycle hyper specific to the uh, New York area in general? No, there are uh, many different broods, 13 broods of 17 year cicadas. What's interesting to me about this one is it's getting a lot of press, a lot of publicity. It's because it involves New York. Last year there were 17 year cicadas out in the Shenandoah Valley. Next year they're going to be out in western Illinois, and the year after that in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and so on. There are also 13 year cicadas that generally live in the south. Um, could you talk a little, is there a kind of competition between males um, in, in terms of uh, finding a female, and do the females wait to pick and choose? Yeah, if, you, if you're one of those people who studies sexual behavior, which actually I am, what you'll find is something unusual, and that is that whereas the sex ratio of the cicadas is probably about 50-50, the operational sex ratio is not. At any given moment in the chorus, there are a lot of males that are ready to mate and not very many females. So the competition among the males is aggressive uh, and, and really over the top. And so you'll find they jam each other's signals. Uh, they push each other aside and try to take over the mate. They do all these sorts of things. You had a question back uh, I was just curious, they're underground apparently for about 17 years. I'm assuming that they're not very active, but like, you would probably know best how active are they, what do they, what do, they, what do, do, they do down there? Do down there? <laughs> yeah, they eat. Yeah. They eat. We know very little about exactly what they do underground, but they do feed because they start up when they hatch, you know, they're like that. And yeah. when they come out, they're like this. So, uh, they do a lot of growing in 17 years. Do you know what they eat? Only one thing. Tree sap. They attach themselves to a tree root and they're sucking sap for 17 years. <laughs> they're feeding on tree xylem, so it's just like you and maple syrup. Yeah. <laughs> they have a tree preference? Sorry, to follow up. Uh, just there are small position preferences, but feeding, they'll feed. This, the reason this guy is not doing what I wanted to do, he's trying to feed on me. And actually, right now, he's trying to mate with me. He's going to tell you. I'll do it. <laughs> have to be selective too, right? So in a male's call, uh, they're looking for the strongest male to mate with them. So what is, what is the, how does the strength reflected in the... That is an absolutely excellent question, and that's the kind of question that got me into this business and working with these cicadas. And I'll pick up on something uh, I think Marlene said downstairs. It turns out, uh, I went into this thinking, hey, the females are going to be choosing among the males. Well, it's sexual selection. We have never been able to demonstrate that, and we do that with our official playback experiments, any kind of experiment you want to name, we've tried it. All we have been able to demonstrate is that females respond preferentially to males of their own species, and that's it. Now, it's a little more subtle than that, because in this chorus of all these cicadas and all that noise and all that activity, those males that have louder calls or are more actively calling those males that are better able to perceive the female responses may roughly, on average, get more mating. It is a kind of passive mate choice at best, nothing more. And is there, uh, to which extent, in your museum or anywhere in New York, like in the open fields or something, can they actually observe the live actions or somewhere? Yeah, where are the cicadas going to be during this? I would be stunned if there were any in Manhattan. Right. <laughs> but they're here on Staten Island. The map downstairs shows you where. Yeah, if you want to see cicadas this time around, you have to come to Staten Island. Yeah. And um, we're, we're giving a, a series of cicada walks to take people out there. But also, if you look at the map on the side, it'll show you the general areas where they're found. So the museum actually gives you the walks? Yeah, we, we will take people on walks, yes. But generally, it's a lot, a lot of action so far on the southern part of the island, from top to bottom, about great kills. And it's starting up more in Mid Island and the northern part. And how long do your people have to be able to come on these walks? When is it going to start really dying down? Um, I'm, I'm giving my last one on June 16th, and after that, yeah, we will we'll start dying down in terms of say third and fourth weeks of the month. And I said by the end of the month, that's really it, and then they'll be gone. And you'll have to wait another 17 years or travel someplace. Yeah. <laughs> to Quincy, Illinois, next yes. year. <laughs> We, 
We weren't planning to. <laughs> well, we did last week. But actually, actually, in the beginning of the week, we had a, oh, a little bit of dinner on the other day. They made the cicadas for me. What is, how did they go? Uh, the panko crusted cicadas served over a kale salad with anchovy mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> and a nice IPS. That's right. Did you like it? Yeah, but it yeah. worked. Yeah. So, so what, what, what about the plug? So what made the plug? <laughs> The mating plug is visible in the female's genital opening after she's mated. It seems to be dry and ejaculate. It probably slows down future matings, but it's not an absolute deterrent. So we've been able to do lab matings where we can get other males to mate and they will get paternity. Not an absolute deterrent. Yes? I was curious if their population is healthy or if habitat loss or pesticides or anything like that? Or excellent, or? excellent question. And the answer is that is exactly why the mapping project is going on. The old maps that you see were actually made by people in the 19th century. Marlatt, Riley, all these greats in the entomological world. But they're 19th century maps. And when you compare those maps to what you have today, there are differences. Are the differences there because the cicadas changed or because we changed the way we make maps? We don't know. So we have these new maps that we're making that are geo-referenced. There's a point in space. Somebody can go back there and vouch for having seen this number of cicadas at that point at this time. You can come back in 17 years and see if it changed. Well, I think on Staten Island also, I think we have lost some because you figure uh, in 1962 there was an emergence. That was before the Verrazano Bridge opened and there was a lot of open land. You had a lot of woodlands. Once the bridge opened, a lot of land was sold. A lot of, you had a lot of Houses put up, roads put in, the highway put in, so we have lost a lot of natural habitat since that time, so I think there probably is a reduction just for that reason, that just because of the development of the island. But there's still a lot left, because we are the borough of parks, so we still have a lot of park lands here. That's where basically you're going to go now if you want to see cicadas. I mean, they're in the neighborhoods too, but you know, old neighborhoods with some big old trees in them still get a good occurrence, but if you really want to guarantee to see that, go to some of the, the city parks on the island. Anyone else? One more? Um, yeah, are there, is there um, a 17 year cycle of predators that accompanies the set? Has that developed? Really, really excellent question. You look at the literature, and many of the explanations for these cycles are oh, these prime numbers, the predators cannot specialize, they can't synchronize with them, and yet, it's right over there in the corner, there is a fungus. Life cycle is perfectly synchronized with that of the cicadas. The fungus is exquisitely specialized to basically consume these cicadas. And you were talking about that fungus a little bit with us kind of backstage earlier. You said it has some pretty strange effects on mating yes. behavior. So, I'm talking about sex. In these cicadas, males call and females respond. Normal males never respond with a wing flick signal. It's not what males do. But this fungus is spread by contact, so what do you think this fungus makes infected males do? They flick their wings and they act like females, and everybody wants to mate with them. And they pass that infection on to other individuals in the same generation. That's an answer.